What is the key word in moving? The key word? Teamwork. The word to count. <laughs> and two words. Two words. Teamwork is two words. Okay, what's the, what's the, the real word? word is chain a command. <laughs> well, that's one word, chain a command? <laughs> yeah, get it, get it. I tell you what to move. And hey, no problem. You move it. <laughs> In the 1986 movie Odd Jobs, Max, played by Paul Reiser, gets his feet wet in the moving business while partnered with a veteran of the industry, Wiley. In this scene, his very first day on the job, Wiley makes it clear that this partnership is more of a dictatorship. After realizing the only moving company option, which is also mob-owned, provides horrendous service, Max and his three friends see an opportunity to start their own moving company. 80s hilarity ensues. Ron Holt also saw an opportunity to disrupt the moving business using some of the same strategies he used to grow a successful home cleaning franchise. So he sold the business he spent 20 years building and embarked on a new journey to start the world's first happy moving company. If you ask Ron what the most important word in the moving business is, he'd probably say culture. This week on Next in Q, we discuss the missing ingredient for a successful business that Ron was missing, how customer feedback changed employee behavior, the one metric that worried Ron while business was booming. What prompted him to get into the moving business? How to go beyond what customers think they want? The nexus of the pink zebra name? How Ron creates employee buy-in to the pink zebra culture? And how pink zebra stands out from the competition? Let's get to it. Welcome to Next in Q, the podcast for contact center and customer experience professionals. Next in Q is brought to you by Happy Two Vision. Eliminate blind spots and see right through every conversation with Happy Two Vision. Learn more at HAPPITU.com. Now, here's your host, Rob Dwyer. Thanks for joining another episode of Next in Q. Today, I'm very excited. We're going to do things a little bit different than what we've done in the past because today we're talking to Ron Holt. Ron, how are you? Doing great, Rob. How are you guys doing? Ah, I'm doing doing fantastic on this end. Ron, we're going to talk about Pink Zebra moving. But before we get there, my understanding is that you're a biology major. (laughs) Why are you not in a lab somewhere, Ron? What's going on? Great question. Um, that goes back a couple of decades now. So I, I'll tell a quick, funny story about that before I tell you all the reasons why. And my, I, my, my children are both, they're young, they're eight and 11, and they know I have a biology degree. And so we were watching Jeopardy recently and the category, of course, was biology. So they're like, dad, you got this. I knew one of the five questions. Um, so <laughs> it, all of that knowledge has escaped my brain. Uh, but Really, more importantly, I did utilize that degree for years. For the first seven or so years of my professional career, I was a chemist. I worked inside of a laboratory, I eventually grew that into management role. And that's when I really started becoming more of an entrepreneurial type minded person. I just started loving the data behind the business and all the nuances of it. Um, the, tr- the stuff we did, you know, that really wasn't as exciting for me. Um, so I did utilize it as a springboard for other things later on in life. But yeah, again, I uh, know very little about biology today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know uh, who is more disappointed, your kids or you in uh, only getting one out of five, but that's okay. 
if you're not on the show, I think it matters less. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you got out of the lab. What did you do when you got out of the lab? Yeah, so I think it's probably actually important for me to tell you what I did during the lab because I would not have been able to escape the lab without all of the work that I did even before then. And so at some point during that time, like I said, I became a manager. I was managing these folks who had crazy degrees, you know, PhDs, chemical engineers, scientists that were globally recognized. Uh, it, it was it was crazy. And they were plus, you know, 30 years older than me at the time. Um it was it was it was a weird deal, but for them, they it all all the business stuff was boring. But for me, it was super exciting. And so again, once I made that self discovery that I'm a business guy, um, I started trying to figure out well, what does that mean? What am I going to do with that? How am I going to start a business? And obviously, to start a business, you need a little bit of money, you need some capital. And so that's what I did for the next several years. It took me seven years actually to raise my seed capital, which was personally raised by myself, just from scratching and clawing my way to it. But I saved one dollar after another until I finally reached one hundred fifty thousand dollars in savings. And that had been what I had identified as sort of my milestone to make this happen, to go ahead and leave corporate America and start a business, a small business. And so that's what I did. That by itself, I could write a book on those seven years because I had to do everything from have really bad nutrition, you know, eat cheap foods all the time, having no social life at all. Um, I actually started a bunch of small little side hustles before they were called side hustles, by the way. And, um, you know, it taught me so much about life. It actually made me a different person uh, because I had to make all these sacrifices that I didn't really expect to make as a young 20 something, you know, but it, it allowed me to get to the the 150 number. And at that point, I left the laboratory and entered this weird world of house cleaning. Um, I started a cleaning business called Two Maids and a Mop. I had one small location in Pensacola, Florida. I moved from Georgia to Florida thinking that you run a business during the day and you fish and beach in the evening. But I could have opened in, you know, Nebraska. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered, you know, because just nonstop works so 24-7 when you start a business without any support, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I started cleaning houses of all things. And I, to this day, when you look back, I, cleaning was a foreign subject for me, very much like my new business I'll tell you about later. Uh, but I saw a real opportunity from a consumer perspective. And that's what excited me and attracted me to, to the industry, which at the time wasn't even an industry. It was just what people did when they didn't have a job, you know. And so... Yeah, started a cleaning business called Two Maids and a Mop. And I'll tell you a whole lot more of the tales from those days if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious, right? How do you scale? Because you ran that company for a couple of decades and it ended up being really large, lots of franchises. How, how do you go from a one-man operation and, and start to scale? What was your strategy there? Well... It took it actually took a few years for me to get past this one man operation that you that you talk about. I, that was never the plan, you know. In, in my head, all the work of preparing for that was the hard work. I thought the business part was going to be easier. Found out pretty quickly that that was even harder than the other stuff, you know. And so for the next couple of years, I lost money. Uh, worked six out of seven days. Uh, so we were in Florida. So we cleaned homes, which was our bread and butter. But since we were in Florida on the beach, we had all these tourist, you know, jobs on the weekends. We cleaned condos and hotels and beach homes and, and places like that. And so all of that work is on Saturday, sometimes even Sunday. So six out of seven days I worked, um, sometimes till midnight, because we also cleaned a few businesses at night. And I lost money uh, as I was doing that. So for the next two years, all 150 of those thousand dollars, we basically lost. And I was, you know, at a real tipping point, like, which, what am I going to do here? Do I reinvest more money? If so, where's that going to come from? Uh, or do I stop? And uh, along the way, I discovered this book called The Purple Cow. You may have heard of it, written by a guy named Seth Godin. It's a... Uh, probably about 20 years old today, but it's a great book, simple principle, but still a great book. 
if you were to see a purple cow in a pasture somewhere in whatever, you know, Iowa, um, are there cows in Iowa? I don't know. Um, they, they do and, have cows in Iowa. Okay. <laughs> in confirm. <laughs> But if you see them in Iowa, they probably look all very similar and very unremarkable. You're not going to remember that moment in time. But if one of those cows is purple, of course, you'll remember it forever. And you can, you know, stamp that in your mind for generations or at least decades. So as, as, as simple of a concept that is, is, is it, it really hadn't dawned on me that my business, Two Mazes and a Mob, needed to be different. I just thought hard work was going to be the secret to my success, which of course it is. Um, but hard work without an identity is just hard work, you know, and that's what I was living through, just this constant race to survive and thinking that every day was going to be better because of what I did yesterday, but there wasn't really any vision for the future. And so when I read that book, Purple Cow, I said, Two Maids and a Mom needs to be different. I got to do something besides just say we're a cleaning company in Pensacola, Florida. And so uh, we built what we still to this day, the brand calls the pay for performance plan. It's a really simple concept as well. When we clean someone's home there, we would ask the customer to rate their level of satisfaction on a one to 10 scale, 10 being good, one being bad. And that number would directly determine the compensation level for the two house cleaners who cleaned that home. And so that was a motivational tool for our employees, but it was really a strong marketing tool for new consumers and for existing customers as well, because they understood that now there was some skin in the game. These employees weren't just employees who were gonna potentially be new employees next week. These these folks could make more, a lot more money in some cases if they made people happy. And so as strong of a motivational tool as that was, it was an equally, if not more important marketing tool for us. And that became our purple cow. Uh, and it, it allowed us to start growing, finally make a few dollars, and start thinking bigger than Pensacola and more importantly, not considering quitting because there was a real, there was a real decision there at one point, a couple of years into it because we just were, you know, going backwards every single day. Yeah. I wonder, did you have any challenges getting the customers to respond to the, to those reading surveys? Because this is a big topic right now. People are feeling uh, some survey fatigue because there are all these surveys out there. Did you find that a challenge? Well, again, I'm dating myself here. So there <laughs> wasn't quite as much survey fatigue as there is nowadays. So <laughs> the first thing we did was we didn't utilize any technology. We had like had an abacus, um, you know, doing the um, the math <laughs> on the paper performance plan. And we picked up an old school phone, probably connected to a wall uh, when we called customers, because that was the best way for us to talk to someone. We we didn't know how else to get feedback. Over time, of course, that improved. And we started utilizing different forms of technology to make life a lot more automated and easy. Um, and so there wasn't much fatigue because we were actively calling people on a regular basis. And we talked to people. Now, here's the thing. When you sign up with a cleaning service like Two Maids, and, and we, during that presentation of our of our pitch you know as a from a sell side we're telling everyone this is why you should hire us because our employees are paid based on your feedback for the most part most people wanted to be involved because of that that's why they hired us you know and so it wasn't it wasn't unexpected it was it was the other, it was the opposite people actually wanted it they they, they wanted to participate um, over time, you would see some fatigue, you know, and so that's when we started working with different forms of technology. Um, and then, you know, we would kind of go like this, you know, like a lot of things, you know, we'd have this bump where we'd see more survey participation and then it would fade and we'd have to try something new. I'm curious, did you learn things aside from how the, the cleaners were performing during these conversations and, and what kinds of things did you learn? Yeah, for, well, so there's, there are people behind those scores. And so you, you learn sometimes the, the feedback wasn't as trade related as you would imagine. Like, Hey, the, 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 the folks did a really good job. I'm going to give them a nine instead of a 10 though, because I heard them talking about uh, a fight they had with their boyfriend in front of my teenage daughter, you know, and so weird things like that, you know, and so we would have those conversations with 
our employees to say, hey, you know, they loved your work. Your craftsmanship was on point today. Um, and you you were just having adult chatter with your teammate there, but the 16-year-old daughter heard it and and um, it affected her, you know, personally. And so just be wary of things like that. Um, as we started evolving and technology started growing with us, we started having more and more cameras installed inside people's homes. And so even if you weren't home, um, sometimes people would say, hey, they did a great job. End result looks good. But I, I actually saw them take a 15 minute break. Um, so that's I'm going to knock them down for that. You know, and so we had we had to learn from those type of exchanges and we would have never received that type of feedback um, because we you wouldn't ask for that, you know, because at the end of the day, if you've hired a cleaning service and the house is clean, whatever, you know, you're not going to call to have one little small thing to talk about, but this, we opened the doors to that communication and that type of engagement. And so it, it, it allowed the customer to tell us, I think it allowed them to tell us things that they may not have communicated otherwise without that program being in place. Yeah. It just speaks to me that there is a lot more to the experience than the, the end result and the specific service that was ordered, because it sounds like there are times when the service itself that was, you know, on the menu, so to speak, they got exactly what they asked for. But there was more to that experience that maybe wasn't on the menu. And and that left an impression with them. Sure. Uh, you know, nowadays everybody has a door cam, but we didn't necessarily have that technology, but people still would be able to determine when we arrived. And so being 10 minutes late, um, affected our ratings in some cases. Some people didn't seem to care. Others, it was a big deal. And so we, we had to learn, okay, this customer, if you're 10 minutes late, you're gonna have to call them to tell them you're 10 minutes late. Otherwise, you're gonna get dinged later, no matter how hard you work over the next two hours. So that type of communication, again, was really critical to us because it made everything personalized. You know, we we got feedback. I don't, again, think we would have received otherwise. We, we knew the names of pet, pets, you know, cats and dogs, and um, we knew which pillow needed to be on this side of the couch versus the other side because of those little small comments that we would ask for every single time. Yeah, very interesting. Well, so after nearly 20 years in that business, uh, you started a moving company? What What happened there? So I'm going to preface this again with a story. I, I know I've already done that a couple of times, but it's important to talk about what happened to me personally to make me even consider opening another business, uh, much less a moving business. So number one, uh, I became obsessed with customer experience after digging through some of our numbers, uh, some really towards the... Um, back end of the first wave of COVID. Um, so in late 2020, um, we actually, it was a bit of a bonanza for us. Like there was this initial horribleness, you know, where we were shut down for a few weeks, but we were an essential provider. Uh, and we, for the most part, were busier in most of our markets than we were pre-COVID, ex except for those, you know, few weeks in March and April. And so revenue was soaring. Um, business was, you know, again, booming, things were great. And so our franchisees are saying, man, it's the best decision of my life. I'm glad I partnered with you. We were getting close to a hundred locations at the time. And so as a leader, you think, well, that's great, you know, but as an entrepreneur, you go, well, what's, what's next, you know, like, what do we need to do? And so one particular piece of data crossed my desk that really scared me and it was customer retention rates. And so we were absolutely killing it on the sales and marketing side. Like we couldn't, it was demand was through the roof. But when you peeled that, that back, there were there, the retention rates were higher than it ever been. And so I was trying to figure out why. And you know, I didn't know the answer. You know, the, the simple answer is, well, you're not cleaning great. You know, like that's why, you know, feedback is still being collected. So what is what are they telling us? Well, customers never say you should leave me balloons. You should never send me a special note. You know, no one says that that's what makes me happy. They always, my job is to pay you for the cleaning. Your job is to perform it. That's how I'm going to measure it unless you define that differently. And so we were defining our entire service level 
um, on the cleaning, the, again, the, the, the craft that we provide and being very reactive to customer service issues. And so I felt like those retention numbers, which were trending in a negative direction, would at some point catch up to us if the demand didn't also, if it also traced downward, you know. So I stood on a podium, uh, a virtual podium at the time and said, hey, we got a problem and we've got to fix it. This is how you do it. Two, two best letters in the dictionary are going to be C and X going forward. And this is what I think we need to do to fix it. We need to be more proactive instead of just reactive to service related issues. And I was uh, essentially booed off stage <laughs> because, again, people were making more money than they'd ever made, you know. And so if you can imagine uh, winning the Super Bowl and then the coach saying immediately, like, OK, next year's rough, you know, so we got we got to get started. Like, dude, celebrate a little bit, you know, and that's that was the reception that I sort of received. And so I said, OK, look. I'm the leader here. Let's go. You know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, it's my job to make people understand the importance of this downward trend with, with customer retention and we got to fix it. And so try to go all in as much as I could. And it reached a point where I was it's actually becoming somewhat divisive because people just weren't believing in what I was talking about. You know, like again, their revenue was continuing to track North. So I had a real decision. Um, I had built a business from one store to almost 100 locations at that time. Uh, we had several thousand people working across the network, um, the top of my career, you know. But I, I wanted to do more. And I was also on the other side of the spectrum, stuck in meetings all day, which um, it, that's a constant thing for me. I, I, I want my day to mean something, you know. And so my day felt less and less meaningful, even though I was more and more powerful. I know that's a weird analogy, but that's that's what I was living. And so I built corporate America without even knowing it, and which is what I raced away from when I started the business forever ago. So all of these emotions were stirring up in my head, like, do I double down and keep fighting? Um, do I quit, you know, and just say, hey, you're right, revenue is great. Let's just turn, you know, turn our head and it's, it's going to go away. Um, all these emotions and thoughts were going through my head. And about that time, my mother-in-law uh, here locally, and we're in Birmingham, Alabama, hired a moving company. And it was a horrible, like, I don't know if you've ever hired a moving company before, but it, there's a lot of war stories out there that aren't, aren't great. And so everything that could go wrong did go wrong for her. And on top of all that, the bill was three times what she thought it was going to be, you know, and so it was a, just a train wreck of an experience, but yet she still had to stroke that check, you know, she still had to pay the guys to do the work. So my entrepreneurial, you know, will started spinning and I said, man, possibly there could be an opportunity here. And so I just went to Yelp. This was my research tool. Uh, and I, I picked three cities, uh, random cities, Seattle, <laughs> Omaha, and Miami. Uh, I felt like that gave me the America, you know, yeah, so yeah. Um, all three of those markets, I went straight to the negative reviews, of course, all three of those had similar experiences as my, my mother-in-law experience and her one-off experience in Birmingham. And uh, I knew a few of the franchise players in, in this space uh, just because we were in home services. And so home service franchise folks roll together. Uh, and I knew that there was some success there. Uh, but more importantly, I saw that no one had really attacked the market utilizing anything other than just sort of cookie cutter approaches. Nobody had said, let's do something different. In other words, nobody had a purple cap. And so that's when I said, you know what? I'm going to sell two maids and mom. Um, can't believe I'm doing that because that's been, that was my firstborn child before I had children, um, but I'm going to sell it. And I'm going to start a moving business. And Pink Zebra Moving was born shortly after that. What did you know about moving? other than your Yelp review research? Uh, in Very little. Uh, I didn't know anything about what I know now, you know, the technical side, how to, how to load a truck, how to unload a truck, how to drive a truck. Um, all of those things were foreign to me, but I knew that, I knew some important things. One, the ticket was high. You know, we were used to a small ticket at Two Maids to Mop, um, you know, hundreds of dollars. 
whereas in the moving business, it's thousands of dollars. So I, I knew there was real opportunity there, big, big tickets. Uh, I knew that when I looked across all those markets, I eventually went beyond this, those three markets and I looked into other markets as well. And I tried to find the good people there. Instead of going straight to the negative, I said, well, what's happening that's, that's good? No one really stood out. Everybody said, hey, we're a moving company. We've been in business for some cases like 75 years or whatever. Um, here we are, you know, hire us. And so no one said anything different. And you've got all of these customers telling you how bad the experience was, but all of those same companies getting more and more business. And so all that negative stuff looked positive to me. And so I, again, looked at it just like two maids. I looked at it from a con consumer's perspective. And I said, there is a real opportunity here to meet a demand that consumers don't even know exists right now. You know, right now, if you ask a, a moving customer, hey, do you want, a, I'll, tell you, I'll tease you with some of this. Do you want, you want free food the night before your move? Uh, or do you want the move to go perfect? Like you want strong guys on steroids um, showing up in a truck and getting the work done. They all would say, I want strong guys to show up, you know, forget the food. Um, we do for, we do provide free food the night before a move occurs. So it's almost sort of like the Henry Ford quote. If you ask um, horse and carriage folks, like what what would you what would you do to make this better? They'd say, I want faster horses. No one would say, I want a car. And so that's who we think we are. We're we're a pioneer in this industry um, right now. Consumers when they when they experience our service, they love it. Um, it's engaging in in, no, in ways they've never thought before. It's fun. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it's um, even humorous. Um, but on the surface, people think they just need strong guys to show up to do the move, you know, because it's our trade is physical labor. It's manual labor. And so we are turning that upside down. And we think that we can create a real positive customer experience before, during, and after a move. And almost every single time we provide the service to a customer, their eyes light up afterwards. Now we we're human. We make mistakes, so I don't want to pretend that we're perfect. Um, but those imperfections don't get exposed as much because of all the engagement that we do during the move itself. Mm -hmm. When you get a chance so, to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask about the name, right? I mean, you're you're a marketing guy, obviously. Uh, if you're reading Seth Godin. And obviously you already mentioned the purple cow, but how did you come up with the pink zebra? Well, it's a little bit of purple cow, pink zebra. I mean, it's, you know, that's, it's a pretty easy parallel there, um, but it wasn't quite that straightforward. And so this is more of a personal story, but it's a fun one. So we were going to call it, I still have a hard time saying it because it doesn't roll off the tongue, pink truck. We were going to call it, that's what we were going to be called. And of course the, truck was going to be pink and everyone hated it but me my wife hated it even and so I said well that's what we're doing because it's great um <laughs> you know I, I, I I'm sometimes a little bit your stuck. first clue was that the wife hated it you should yeah, have known much. right then and yeah. there you were in the wrong so one of our um gifts to ourselves uh, after I sold two maids uh, I mean late 2021 was to just go on a trip. And so we, you couldn't travel then. So you couldn't travel abroad at least. And so we went down to the Florida Keys and we were on a boat. And I don't know if you've ever been on Seven Mile Bridge, but Seven Mile Bridge is seven miles long, of course. But more importantly, one side is the Gulf of Mexico. The other side is the Atlantic Ocean. It's magical. It's like perfect. And we were there in like November. So it wasn't crazy hot. And so um, anyway, we're there. We're there for a few hours floating, having some drinks, just enjoying life. Meanwhile, above us, cars are whizzing by. You don't pay attention to those things because you're in paradise, right? And so um, somewhere during those few hours we were there, I was drawn to a truck passing over us and on the bridge, and it was a black and white zebra-striped moving truck. And I followed it, you know, for the next mile and immediately got on my phone and said, where is this back? I found they were based out of South Florida and they were black and white zebra stripe. I forgot their name now. And I told my wife, pink truck's gone, pink zebra's in, you know? And so that's how <laughs> pink zebra was born. Um, but it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, um, 
a, you know, sort of an ode to my love for the concept behind Purple Cow. Yeah, no, I love it. So I'm wondering, you know, after 20 years in the home services business and, and you're moving into this new moving business that you don't know a lot about. What lessons did you take with you that you had already learned that translated immediately that you could put into play? So we're actually in two different industries, home services, obviously, uh, cleaning, moving, so on. But we're also in the franchise industry. And franchising is a very unique industry. And unless you've been in it before, you don't really get it. Um, Franchising is best described as a way to make business easier. Uh, for a business owner. And so if you avoid some of the startup pains that I had to go through with both of my businesses, and you also have a network that you can work with and say, hey, what's working in your market? And here's what's working in mine and so on. Um, So living both of those worlds really allowed for act two, things you were moving uh, to be much less crazy. So we had to learn uh, as we were building two maids into a franchise brand, we had to learn how to be a franchise or like, what does that mean? Training support, obviously, but what, what does that mean? Um, how do you build a territory? You know, we, we sold one of our early territories was in Washington, DC. We sold the entire DC market. Um, I'm talking Northern Virginia, Maryland and DC itself. Um, that's a no, no. <laughs> we didn't know that. Um, but it, you know, we had to live those lessons the hard way and, and deal with the consequences from bad decisions as well. And so when you put all that together, now that we're able to, a lot of people don't get act two, you know, and so we're now living through act two. A lot of the people who were with me at two mates, uh, were thankfully able to transition with me here at pink zebra moving. And so we've got all that knowledge and expertise and history, and we're able to in most cases, avoid some of the mistakes we've already made in the past. And so we we persevered, obviously. We made it through those mistakes and we're fine. Um, but it's it's certainly a lot easier knowing what not to do. Uh, now, we mm-hmm. still make mistakes. You know, again, we're human beings, but um, it's 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 a much easier ride. I will say that because we know we, we're not going to sell D.C. to one person. <laughs> you know, um, right. you know we, we're, we when it comes to training and support, uh, the first franchisee that purchased from us at Two Maids, uh, I feel sorry for them. They ended up building an amazing business, but we basically just said, hey, here's a book, read it, go, um, send us some royalty checks. And so um, they did it, thankfully, but that's that's not how you train and support someone, obviously. And so we uh, we had to really fine tune that. By the end of my time at Two Maids, we had a, a world-class training and support organization. And that's what I believe we have here now. Um, but we didn't have to go through all the startup pains to get there. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the employee experience and the customer experience that you have today with, with Pink Zebra. What is it that you're doing differently aside from, you know, the, the meal the night before? Because really those, those, uh, I assume mostly guys, but uh, probably some women coming in too that are moving all of your stuff. I worked as a mover for one summer at a college, and I can tell you that um, I was not uh, focused on customer experience. <laughs> so what are you doing today and how do you get the employees on board? Good question. And so... I, um, we struggled with that early on. So when I sold two maids, I went all in on just building a movement company in Birmingham. You know, we weren't talking crazy stuff like taking over the world at that time. Now that was part of the plan, but step one was just building a successful moving business in my hometown. And then we would go from there. And so those first few employees I brought in, I told this almost same story I'm telling you to all of those folks. And they were like, yeah, let's do this, you know? Um, and then when they got in the field, small little things happened, but nothing crazy big. And so what I what I had what I learned, and what we still do to this day, is we we just ask people the question like, what story do you have from yesterday? And so if you know your intent is to go and create, deliver, and report a story, and your supervisor asks you that question every day, 
at some point you're going to either say I'm out because I'm not delivering what they want from me, or I'm going to deliver what they want from me, you know? So, um, small little stories started coming back like, Hey, I, um, you know, I gave them 15 minutes for free. Um, you know, silly stuff like, or I, um, they had a, they had a, they had a little closet that they forgot to include in the inventory. We moved all that stuff for free. Um, or the, the, you know, the customer was a little bit older and they needed uh, assistance to their car. I walked them to their car, you know, little, little things like that. Um, but over time they started getting bigger and bigger because they started again, building on themselves. And so our, our experience, our customer experience is more than just a move. And so I don't want to define everything on by just move day. We think before, during and after are all equally important. Um, and I'll tell you more about those things if you want, but the move movers, the guys themselves, once you ask in that morning meeting, and we do this now across all of our locations, what stories do you have from yesterday? What positive customer related stories do you have from yesterday? As a manager, as an owner of that business, it's your job to inject that type of culture where there's an expectation for that to occur. If the owner or manager does not believe that that's an expectation, then the stories won't manufacture themselves. And so it it's as much as I love process and systems, that's what franchising is, culture is the heart of customer experience. You can you can automate a lot of stuff, but at some point, someone's body, their heart has to take action, you know? And so it's that simple, you know, it's that simple and that complex at the same time, just asking and expecting for those types of personal engagements to incur, to occur. Now we have bigger stores, you know, we've, we've had, we've had just recently, we, we had, we had someone who the moot, Moves. I don't, again, I don't know if you, have you have you moved recently. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually. There's a running joke in in my office that every time I take PTO, uh, it's because I'm moving or moving someone. Yeah. Uh, so so just uh, a few months ago, I uh, bought a new house and moved, and and I did do the U-Haul. Like I said, I I did a summer moving, so I feel like I'm relatively competent in that area. But it's it's a lot of hard work. Well, it's a lot of hard work. And for whatever reason, what I've discovered, there's a lot of bad luck uh, on moving day as well. <laughs> yes. So there was one particular customer just a few weeks ago in one of our locations. And bad luck was happening for this customer, the, the husband, wife, throughout the day. Close time, you know, the time for the closing for the new home was getting bumped and bumped and bumped. Um, things that... Uh, they had packaged or or packed for us. They didn't pack well and were broken. Um, they were having some issues with their teenage kids um, in front of us. Like everything that could go wrong seemed to go wrong for these guys. And here we are just trying to do our job. And so one of our movers saw this happening or heard this happening and said, you know, let's go do something. And so they went out into the front yard and they patched together a fake four leaf clover. It wasn't actually a four leaf clover, but they put some tape together and made it look like that. And uh, they framed that somehow they had a frame in the truck. And so they put it in a small frame and, um, you know, wrote a note or something on there and delivered that to the customer and just said, hope your day is better, you know, or something to that effect. And it's small as that is, you know, that changed everything about the direction of that move um, because all of these bad luck things were happening in their personal life. They had nothing to do with us, but all it was going to take is for us to make one mistake and we were going to get the wrath, you know, because we, that's what happens in the, in the service industry. You oftentimes as the service provider um, or your performance is measured against other pr providers as well, you know? And so um, we turned that around. Um, I don't know if their day actually became more positive or better, but I do know that in their review, they didn't talk about strong guys. Um, they didn't talk about how we moved. They talked about that fake four leaf clover. <laughs> so yeah. um, little things like that, that's all culture based. There's no book, there's no system that we have that says, hey, when you hear somebody having a bad day, go find a four leaf clover. Um, it's just, it, 
you know that, hey, here's an opportunity tomorrow morning. I get to tell this story to the guys and I'll be able to check that off. I won't have to be the one that doesn't have a story from today. Yeah, it just seems like a way to infuse empathy into the work. And, and it, right, that's part of why the company started in the first place, right, was understanding how you would like your mom to have experienced a move and trying to build something that she would appreciate and love. Yeah, uh, she cried. She it was my mother-in-law, but she was very emotional. And you know, I remember she said, "You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a bad review. That'll get them. That'll teach them." I'm like, eh, "I don't know. Will it? There's other negative reviews, and you hired them. You know, so somebody else is going to hire them again." And so I said, "Why don't I think I might start a business to do this?" And she looked at me like, "What? Are you crazy?" She still she wants royalty checks today because she's. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least she knows who to go to if she needs to move again. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we actually finished the move for her about a year. So a lot of a lot of times people when they move nowadays, they're not quite ready to move into the next home. You know, there's mm. a some type of um delay or what for whatever reason. And so a lot of people have to move into a stores pod or facility and have a short-term rental of some sort until they're ready to move into the next place. And so that happened with her. And so when she went to move all the stuff out of her storage facility, everything was broken. Like things that she didn't know were broken, were broken and of course pushed in the very back. So we did finish that for her and she was a much better experience for her. And she got some free food too the night before her move. That's good. That's good. So what other kinds of things are, are you doing at Pink Zebra to disrupt that industry? So this is the fun part. So all of it's fun, I guess, but this is really, I, I think it's kind of fun. So I've talked about this a lot, but the night before a move, we do provide a free unexpected surprise meal to all of our customers. And so they eat it up. See what I did there. Uh, every time we make that call, wow, we had people, wow, wow. <laughs> that was a good dad joke, right? Yeah. I appreciate that as, <laughs> as a fan of dad jokes. I appreciate it. I'm not sure everyone else will, but I did. <laughs> So um, that starts, that's, that's not, that's not everything we do, but that's sort of what we've become known for. That's kind of our trademark. Here's the crazy thing. We do some very basic things that most companies do, but since no one in the moving industry does it, we stand out. For instance, when you book a move and then you wait on the move to happen, which is usually a few weeks later, uh, maybe two weeks later, let's say there's 14 days in that case of just nothing. Right. And so you said, okay, I'll pay you two grand for the move in two weeks from now. Whew, got that off the you know checklist. Let's let's wait. Well, anxiety built during those 14 days typically, and you're framing what that service is going to look like in your mind because the company has not framed it for you. They haven't defined anything. And so we said, why don't we just start doing that? Why don't we start doing more than saying, hey, here's your contract, sign it, we'll be there in 14 days. So we start with humor. We send out a funny video immediately upon booking the video. We have a mascot named Zeke, of course, because he's a, a pink zebra. Um, we've got Zeke along with some of our local moving guys in the gym working out, you know, doing jump ropes, running in place and um, just, you know, pumping some iron. And it's a joke, you know, showing these guys in action, getting ready for this big move day in two weeks. And it's a 40 second video, but it's it starts the tone, you know. And really all we're trying to do at that point is slowly develop a relationship with our customers because moving is very transactional. It's not, you're not supposed to be friends. You certainly shouldn't have a relationship with any service provider, much less a moving company. And so we, we try to turn that around and actually have that relationship. And it, we know it can't happen overnight. You know, maybe we have one already, um, but if we, most people we don't, you know, and so Starts with that video. Uh, we send some practical things out, like top 10 tips to prepare for your move or whatever, you know, and then some other practical things like, hey, we're going to be there at eight o'clock on Tuesday. Don't forget. And so on. But along the way, we also do some more fun, engaging types of things, um, usually using Zeke in some way. Um, and then we finish that pre-delivery of the service up with the free food offer. And so before we ever show up, for that move, we've talked to these folks a lot. I mean, we've talked to them 
in various ways from text, from email to gifting, you know, even. And so all of those modes of communication help, again, build a stronger and stronger relationship. So when Move Day gets here, this, this is not a stranger. This is not just people showing up on a truck that you don't know if they're even going to show up or not. You know we're going to show up because we've talked to you obsessively over the last two weeks. Uh, that's a real thing. A lot of people hire moving companies and they go, oh, gosh, I hope they show up because if they don't, <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and that's 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 hard because now, again, even if they do show up, that moving company is set up for failure because they're already on edge. They're already ready to pounce if something goes wrong. So um, anyway, we <clears throat> do all those things. Move day is move day. Some of the fun things we do beyond some of the uncoordinated things like I talked about. Uh, one, we have music playing throughout the day. It's a happy playlist, of course, because we call ourselves the, wor the world's first happy moving company. Uh, all sing along songs you know, that you know of, um, different genres. Uh, but we put those speakers throughout the home, play music, simple, small thing. But it, it really sends a message that we're here to engage, that we don't want to just put our uh, head, you know, our, our hoodie on and our ear pods and work for the next eight hours. We want to put on a show for you. This is going to be a bit of a, a theater type of experience for you. And so music plays throughout the day. That usually creates engagement with customers because when you you were a mover, so you've been in those homes where it's just super quiet. Maybe the homeowner's working off to the side somewhere on his laptop or her laptop and you're working, you're like physically working and it's awkward. And so it's awkward for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so music is simple. Again, uh, the thing is that it is connects everyone. And so we, we use that as that engagement tool. Before the move begins, we do a walkthrough. Uh, walkthroughs are practical things that every moving company does. But after the walkthrough, we put on a little bit of an exercise routine. The, the lead, the team lead gets the guys ready and says, hey, this is what we're going to do today. Again, practical stuff. Uh, customer, are you ready? Yes, let's go. And then they do a 60 second silly exercise routine from jumping jacks to push ups to running in place again. Um, just to, it's silly, you know, but they're paying us by the hour. So we can't abuse time. So we don't want to overdo it on move day with a lot of those things. Um, our trucks are crazy. Zeke always shows up if there's children around. And so there's usually more to it than just us physically moving people. And then even after the move, there's more stuff going on. So again, one of our, our trademark is that free food. Our second trademark, if we have another one, would be what we call the surprise box. After a move uh, is completed, one of the movers strategically places what we call a surprise box with a pink bow around it, somewhere that's going to be discovered later. You know, there it's clearly not a box that they need because it's got a pink bow on it it says from us pink zebra moving but it's a moving box and maybe it's in the garage or basement or whatever but they find it 30 minutes later two days later whatever inside of it are chocolates and candies and you know fun generic things like that but more importantly there's a personalized note that says hey customer i saw you you know i know your name um, today was great thank you for hiring us whatever simple small things but there's usually also a personalized gift. Um, and that's where we, we have to know our customers for this to work. If we just provide someone with a coffee mug, it's going to look like a generic coffee mug. But if this is a teacher, now kids are going back to school this time of year. Um, maybe we're moving someone right now who is a teacher and we have a coffee mug that says world's best teacher. You know, that customer then goes, wow. I wasn't just another transaction to them. They know what I do for a living, you know? And so that coffee mug, they could have bought off Amazon, but it means more because we, the care, the thought that we put towards it. So all of those personalized things that we do um, are really, again, meant overall to just build a relationship with our customers. So all of that happens before, during, and after. Um, there's a lot of structure to that, but there's a lot of uncoordinated things as well that just manufacture by themselves organically. Yeah, I love it. And it's all about an experience, right? It, you are literally creating an experience out of something that, yeah, will have an experience because moving is an experience. It's usually a, a rough one too. And I think that's one of the things that I love about this. As 
a veteran of the of moving <laughs> moved so many times and helped other right, people move good stories like, about yourself <laughs> yeah it's just um it's a it's a difficult thing it's difficult when you have people coming into your home because there's a, a little bit of a an invasion almost happening uh, particularly when there are strangers that maybe you don't know or or you know trust Mm-hmm. And so overcoming those barriers is a really big factor in creating that long lasting impression. And it sounds like you've really figured out a way to do that and repeat it over and over and over. Yeah. Our, our tagline is we make moving fun. We, we think we can make it fun. We think people can actually look forward to hiring Pink Zebra Moving, like what's going to happen? Like what's what's crazy thing are they going to do for us today? We actually have people who say that, like our neighbors hired you and they you gave them free food and you did this crazy thing. Like we're ready. Like we can't wait. Yeah. But now there's added pressure to that because I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't. What are we going to do crazy today? You know. So, um, but with that pressure, that's that's good because that means the word spreading. You know, that's that's the whole point of what we're doing. When I, when I looked at how do I grow this next brand, I knew franchising because of my two maids experience. I was nervous that franchising would not allow the culture to permeate as much as I wanted it to, because with a franchise organization, you it's individually owned in that market. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're very, we're being very selective. Uh, we only have, we're only in 10 locations right now. We could probably be in a lot more. I know we could be in a lot more locations if we just said, open the doors. Um, but we're making sure, at least we're trying to make sure that we open with the right people that really understand customer experience, understand why we exist, the purpose behind our brand and what their job as an owner is to do. You know, you're, the owner's job isn't necessarily to move, drive trucks and not even to supervise employees in most cases. It's to it's to it's to drive culture, you know, and so that yeah. CX culture, either you believe in it or you don't, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm over the top a believer, you know, but you, you've talked to people and you've probably seen CX go one ear, not the other. Like that's all hogwash. You know, there's no even data, not a ton of data behind it. Um, so either you get it or you don't. And in my case, I, I overdose on it, but um, that's what we look for in our, in our owners is you, you got to really believe that customer experience is the reason that we're going to disrupt this industry. Yeah. Oh, I love it, Ron. And uh, I know that you're serious about it because you were willing to sell a company when your franchisees were not necessarily on board with it and and start something new. So it's clear that you have a passion for it. And I think there are a lot of lessons that other people can take away right from this into their own business because it is just about creating a great experience for people so that they want to come back. They want to recommend other people to use your business. And I have to imagine that almost every single time you move someone, you're making that happen. Yeah, that's, you know, that's our goal. You know, we, we, we want people when we pull off to go, holy cow, in a good way, holy cow. Can you believe they did that? Can you believe Pink Zebra Moving did that? Um, and so that's, you know, sometimes our service offerings are more generic. Um, they don't always have the four leaf clover stories attached to them, in other words. But um, we do expect everyone to have those stories, you know. So while everyone does it, because, you know, sometimes moves aren't celebratory. Sometimes there's divorce. Sometimes there's even death. Um, we do expect all of our franchisees and along with their employees to work hard to to deliver those what we call unique and remarkable customer experiences and so if that's your goal at some point you're going to do it you know and so sometimes you hit the bullseye sometimes you don't uh, but every now and then you do and when you do uh, it it really it leaves a mark even when you don't it does in most cases because we're a moving company the expectations are so low that all we've got to do is (laughs) in some cases show up on time and we've won (laughs) yeah well, Ron, I really appreciate you joining me on Next in Q today. Thank you so much and and keep up the great work and and keep inspiring people out there to deliver those great experiences. Well, Rob, it was an honor, pleasure. I love being here. I love telling the story and I 
appreciate the opportunity to tell more about the Pink Zebra moving story. Next in queue is brought to you by Happy To and is produced by me, Rob Dwyer. If you enjoy this podcast, please, by all means, subscribe and or rate this podcast in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. But more importantly, please tell just one person about this podcast. Word of mouth is the best way for people to discover new content. As always, thanks for listening.